you and I have been forgiven so much. We have been shown so much grace by the Father. We have been treated incalculably better than our sins deserve. Now that is simple gospel truth. It is the foundation for everything about us. But at the same time, we so easily forget it. You're listening to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths. I'm Steve Hiller, and Jonathan, uh, you're right. It is so easy to forget some of the basics of the Christian life. Uh, You you think that's just one of the, maybe a tactic of the enemy? He's trying to get us to forget that? I think it's a tactic of the enemy, and I think it is a tendency of the human heart. You know, we're shown kindness. We see it in family life, don't we? we? We see it in relationships in the community. We see it in the workplace. You know, we're we're extended grace, we're shown kindness, and at the the moment of receiving those things, they warm our heart and they're they're great in our minds, and very soon we forget the benefit and we forget the kindness and we forget the grace and we're looking for the next thing. And in the Christian life, it can be like that. You know, we first come to Christ, we come to a knowledge of the truth and understanding of the forgiveness of sin, and we're overwhelmed by that, and it changes our lives, And very soon, the early dew of morning is gone away by noon, as the hymn writer says, and we forget these things. And we need to be reminded, and that's why we turn to the Scriptures again and again, to have a fresh sense of wonder of the kindness of God in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, let's turn to the Scriptures right now. Colossians chapter 3 is where we are at as we begin a message called, Putting on the New. Here is Jonathan. Far too often we hear reports and accounts, don't we, of dysfunctional churches, of unhealthy Christian communities. Many of you here will have had your own experiences of dysfunctional Christian community. We've all heard the reports. Many of us have had these experiences that we would sooner put behind us. And while we have so much to be thankful for, we know that we too are far from perfect. We know that we have much to learn, and we know that we need to grow in grace. I take it that we all want to pursue wholesome, flourishing, and life-giving Christian community. If we're followers of Jesus Christ, that's the only kind of church that we want to be part of, of course. But all this raises a question for us. How do we pursue healthy Christian community together? What do we prioritize in the power of the Spirit of God? What are we to do, and where are we to begin? Paul has been hard at work in this section of Colossians teaching us how to pursue holiness, how to grow in godliness, and increasingly his focus has been on how we do these things together corporately as a community of the people of God. In the opening verses of chapter 3, the focus was really on what we need to stop doing and what we need to avoid doing. But here in our passage today, Paul turns to the positives, to what it is we must embrace, what it is we must seek to do through his strength. And as he sets these things out, he actually, I think we'll find, gives us a framework for pursuing healthy, God-honoring, life-giving Christian community. If we would be a church that flourishes and that enables the flourishing of every believer, here is what we must be and here is what we must do. Four things in particular. First, put on love for the people of Christ. Notice it again with me there in verse 12. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. One of the great surprises and disappointments of the Christian life is the discovery that other Christians can actually be quite difficult, (laughs) difficult to get along with, to find that, that relationships within the church family can actually be immensely challenging from time to time, that brothers and sisters can sin against one another, that interactions among believers are very often very far from simple and straightforward. It is a tough reality check when that dawns for each one of us. But if you've been a believer for any length of time, if you have participated in Christian community in just about any context, you will know how it is. You will know that this is true. 
And the reason for it, of course, is that we still have our old sinful nature within, what the Bible calls the flesh. We are still works in progress, each and every one of us. None of us has reached complete godliness, complete perfection. We have our rough edges. We have our sinful inclinations. We have our flaws and failures aplenty. And if you take a, a big crowd of saved and redeemed but still sinful people and you bring them together in community, you know what? There's going to be messiness and even occasional misery. That's just how it is, I'm afraid. And God in his wisdom, you know, he hasn't taken away all the problems and all the pain this side of heaven, but rather he has called us to the more difficult thing of navigating the tough dynamics with godliness and dependency upon him by his spirit. Now, as our passage sets out this challenge before us, it begins actually with gospel reality, and this is so important. We who know Christ, verse 12, are God's chosen ones. These are gospel realities. We are those upon whom he has set his saving love. We are holy, says Paul, not because we've, we've done good things, but because Jesus has made us holy by his blood shed for us at, at Calvary. He set us apart from the world to be his special possession, his holy people. We are beloved, loved by God, not because of anything lovely within us, no, no, but because God has poured out his saving love in Jesus through his grace. This is who we are. This is the gospel reality of what God has done for us if we belong to Christ by faith. And in Christ, God has given us a new character and a new power, all of which comes from him by his Spirit. And now, having received these things, we are to put on that which he has given to us in the gospel. We are to put on, he says, compassionate hearts. You know, I don't think we naturally and easily look upon the struggles and the heartache and the pains of others with hearts of compassion. You know, we so naturally and so easily look inward on our own needs and our own concerns, and we all too easily overlook the heartache and the need of those around us. But the God to whom we belong, well, remember what he did. (laughs) He looked down from heaven upon a sinful and a dying people, and he sent his Son for our redemption. He didn't need to do that. The the Jesus to whom we are united by the Spirit, he, he looked out on a needy people in his earthly ministry. And you remember, we're told he had compassion on them because he saw that they were as sheep without a shepherd. And Paul says, put that on. Put on that heart of compassion. Put on God's own heart. And, and with it, put on kindness, not harshness, as we might be inclined toward, not judgmentalism, kindness. And with it, put on humility, not pride, not a, a sense of self-sufficiency or self-accomplishment or self-congratulation, no, uh, humility, and with it, meekness, not making much of yourself, but being ready to be of little account, to serve quietly, to deal carefully with others, not out of a sense of your own ego or entitlement or importance. And with all these patience, put on patience, how we need that, how I need that. We want things to go our way, don't we? And we want them to go our way uh, now. Church life, community life among brothers and sisters, it takes a whole lot of patience, doesn't it? And I think we find that particularly hard because we actually have very, very high expectations of other Christian people. Isn't that right? We expect things to go smoothly and easily within the family of God. We expect people to agree with us. And when things don't go smoothly and when people don't agree with us, as often happens, we are very prone to become impatient with one another. But that's what's called for. It reflects the heart of God, who is so very, very patient with us. He is the God who delays his judgment upon this world because he is patient and he desires that none should perish. He's the God who bears with us in all our folly and our sin and who does not disown us when we deserve to be disowned. And in that same spirit, then, we are to bear with one another, even forgiving one another if one has a complaint against another. And if you and I struggle to do these things, we have to take note of the pretty heavily loaded reminder that Paul gives us of our need and of our own standing. It's there in verse 13, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Here is the bottom line when it comes to our attitude and our disposition toward others. You and I have been forgiven so much. We have been shown so much grace by the Father. 
we have been treated incalculably better than our sins deserve. Now, that is simple gospel truth. It is the foundation for everything about us. But at the same time, we so easily forget it. It's the remarkable thing, but we do. When it comes to our interpersonal relationships within the church, when it comes to a situation where we have been offended or we feel that we have not been treated with the dignity that is our due, when we see the failure and the sin of others and we want to call that person to account, suddenly we forget that we have been forgiven so much, so often with such patience and with such grace. We forget that we rest entirely upon the undeserved mercy of God. That's true of each of it and every one of us, of course. And then we turn around and we refuse to extend that forgiveness to others. And when we do so, of course, it is a denial of the gospel, pure and simple. No, we need to put on the gospel reality that is ours in Christ. We need to live and behave as a redeemed people. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. There's no wiggle room within that. We're going to pause right here, but we'll get back to this message, putting on the new from Jonathan Griffiths in just a moment. You're listening to Encounter the Truth, and we want to help you get a better understanding of God's Word. Part of that is knowing that it's reliable and trustworthy. Have you ever looked at the Gospels, you know, those first four books of the New Testament, and maybe you've seen that there's some differences between those Gospels. It's cost you to ask the question, well, can I believe those? Can I trust them? Well, New Testament scholar Peter Williams, he looks at the evidence of the Gospels from non-Christian sources, as well as looking at how accurately these four accounts reflect the cultural context of the day. He compares the different accounts of these same events that we find in the Gospels, and he looks at how these texts were handed down through the centuries. And in doing all of that, he shows us that whether you're a skeptic or a scholar, you can find some real powerful arguments for trusting the Gospels as really trustworthy accounts of Jesus' earthly life. We'd love to send you a copy of his book, Can We Trust the Gospels, as our way of saying thank you for your financial support this month. You can give online at EncounterTheTruth.org or when you call us at 1-833-99-TRUTH. That's 1-833-998-7884 or EncounterTheTruth.org. Back to the message, here is Jonathan. Now, there are lots of relational pieces here that Paul has set before us, you know, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, patience, forgiveness, but they all hold together, Paul tells us. There is a unity to them. I don't know if you or perhaps your children have ever made anything with with hammer beads or uh, perler beads, as I think they're sometimes called, you know, plastic little beads. Can you picture those things? Colored beads, hollow centers. If you take those, if you can picture that, you take these little colored beads and you place them upon a a plastic base that has little spikes in it, uh, perhaps shaped as something like a car or a train or a heart. Maybe that's quite apt for our illustration here. And then when they're all carefully put in place, you take a sheet of wax paper and you, you place that over them and you take a hot iron and you push it all down until the beads melt together, are fused into the shape of whatever the design is, now permanently bound together and your child presents it to you and then you don't know what to do with it. You use it as a coaster for a little while, but it melts with a hot cup of coffee, and then quietly you throw it away when no one's noticing. Okay, well, that's how it kind of goes. Now, notice with me what it is that holds all the beads together in what Paul is saying here, verse 14. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Put on love, says Paul. You know, again, I don't think we naturally overflow with love toward others, especially toward those with whom we have differences or disagreements within the church. We don't overflow with a natural love there, do we? But God is love. And we know that to be true, don't we? Because he sent his son for us to be the propitiation for our sins. We've experienced his love. We've seen his love. We've received his love. And now in Christ, we are united to this God of love. And his spirit works within us to enable us to be a loving people. And there is this fundamental reality that unites us with other believers. We are now together, his, his chosen ones, as he said, as, as Paul said, holy and beloved. We are brothers and sisters in Christ in the family. And this family reality is the dynamic that binds us together in an unbreakable way. And above all these, we are to put on love. That's what we're called to. So let me ask you, how is it going for you seeking to love your brothers and sisters in Christ? I wonder, how is it going for you? 
seeking to have a heart of compassion toward those who are in need and in distress. I wonder how easy you are finding it to show kindness to them, to interact with brothers and sisters in humility. I wonder how easy you are finding it to be meek in the midst of a dynamic where other believers are perhaps failing to do so themselves. I wonder how easy you are finding it to be patient. Some brother or sister is sorely, sorely testing your patience. I wonder how easy you are finding it to bear with one another, with believers who are being difficult, challenging, obstinate. I wonder how easy you are finding it to forgive. Perhaps when you've been wronged and deeply hurt, deeply hurt by a brother or sister. I guess for most of us, in key seasons of challenge, the answer will be, you know, I'm not finding those things very easy at all. Actually, to be honest, I'm finding this very, very hard. I think that's the truth of it, isn't it? We can all relate. And so here is our invitation, and here is our challenge. We must put on the characteristics that are ours already in Christ. We are a beloved people, recipients of the love of God, so put on love. We are a forgiven people, recipients of the most extraordinary forgiveness from God, and so we learn to forgive. Now, I think we see evidence of all these things This is a cause for praise, that here is a fellowship where these things are in evidence, happening in considerable measure. But at the same time, we can hardly claim to have arrived with this. You know, we still have a way to go. We still have plenty of room to grow. And so with that in mind, I want you just to imagine with me, I want to invite you to imagine with me a church family, a fellowship of believers where verses 12, 13, and 14 are truly being lived out with perfect consistency. Let me read the verses again and try and imagine in your mind's eye what this would actually be like. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. What a church that would be, where those things happen with perfect consistency. What a marvelous community that would be to be part of. Put on love for the people of Christ. Next, let the peace of Christ rule your heart. Verse 15, notice it there with me. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. It's interesting here in a section where Paul is focused on relationships within the church that he should emphasize peace within our hearts. You see, I read that. I read the call, you know, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, and I immediately think, of my own personal concerns and the implications for me. If God gives me a deep sense of his peace, I'll, you know, I'll sleep better, I'll be happier, and, and so on, which is no doubt true. But Paul is thinking here about the body of Christ. He makes that clear. He says so in verse 15. This peace is the thing to which we were called in one body. And so we are prompted, aren't we, to consider the nature of the, the connections here. And we don't have to ponder for too long before we gain insight. Now, here is something that I've observed, and maybe you have observed it too. When a person within a Christian family is causing waves and disruption, is picking fights even, is caustic or full of unjust criticism or something like that, I'm afraid, of course, this sort of thing does happen in churches from time to time. When, when, it, when an individual is behaving like that, I've come to see over time that there is usually something else going on in their heart. The, the presenting issue is rarely the underlying issue, the fundamental issue, the real issue. And, and the need is not actually to satisfy the immediate issue or complaint. The need is actually for God to do a deep work in this person's heart and to bring them to a place of real peace. But if the peace of Christ rules the heart, well, we're in a totally different place. Now, this is a different context, but just perhaps to drive home the point of it's helpful. If you were to think of a a leader in a nation who was a real warmonger, and I won't name names here, but history has provided us with some awful examples of this, as has uh, contemporary uh, news, really. But um, if you think of a ruler who is a brute and a bully who stirs strife and conflict, and then imagine for a second how different a place the world would be if the peace of Christ ruled that particular heart. I mean, imagine it, the world would be transformed. Countless lives would be saved. I've often thought that in different times of conflict. If only this leader who is bent on war, if only this person knew the peace of Christ within, what a difference that would make. 
Now, the context is, of course, different, but we're thinking of the local church and interpersonal relationships within the church. But we see the truth that Paul is, is driving at. If the peace of Christ rules the heart of the individual, community relationships are transformed for good. But to fully grasp what Paul is talking about here, we need to consider the multiple dimensions of the peace of Christ. Foundationally, Jesus is the one who gives us objective peace with God. We think of Romans 5 and verse 1. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's, that's the essence of the gospel, of course, and it's the foundation of everything else. Having then been set at peace with our maker and our judge, the peace of Christ then allows us a subjective sense of inner peace, the kind of peace that you know, lets us put our head on the pillow and sleep at night, knowing that despite all our worldly concerns, all our failures and all our sin, despite all those things and more, all is fundamentally well with us. You know, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever, my Lord, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. That's the peace of Christ. But then this Christ who gives us objective peace with God and a subjective experience of peace within, he then teaches us and in fact requires us to live at peace relationally with one another, and he enables us to do that by his Spirit. And so the Christ who is our Lord, and we must remember that he is our Lord, he causes his peace to rule within our hearts. That's the language here. His peace is a comprehensive whole. It comes to us as a gift of grace, but here's the thing. Just as we need to you know, put on the kindness of God, so also we need to allow the peace of Christ to rule within our hearts. We need to submit our worries and our, our cares and our concerns to him and take hold of his peace. We need to submit our inclinations to demand our own way, to push and to spar. We need to submit all that to him, and we need to allow his peace to rule. You'll notice the extra instruction at the end of verse 15, which actually kind of looks like a throwaway at first glance, but of course, because of the tightness of the logic of the Apostle Paul, it's closely linked. But he says here, and be thankful. Let the peace of Christ rule and be thankful. When we're in a state of inner turmoil, gratitude quickly disappears, doesn't it, in the rearview mirror? I, I'm all worried and chewed up about something, and I can't see anything to be grateful for. I'm in a state of conflict with another believer. It's all their fault, you know, as it always is. The Lord hasn't shown them yet the error of their ways. I'm waiting for that, and I'm too grumpy to be thankful for anything. No, no, no. Let the peace of Christ rule your heart. And as you enjoy his peace and submit to his peace, remember with gratitude all that you have in Christ. Forgiveness, cleansing, power by the Spirit, hope for eternity. Be thankful. Jonathan Griffiths here on Encounter the Truth and our message, Putting on the New. Now we have to pause right here, but we'll continue this message next time. Hope you'll make it a point to tune in, but if you ever miss a broadcast, you can come and you can listen online. Our website is EncounterTheTruth.org. Well, we depend here at Encounter the Truth on your generosity to keep the program and the podcast going. So thank you for giving to this ministry. And as you give a gift of any amount this month, we want to send you a book called Can We Trust the Gospels? It's written by Peter Williams. And Jonathan, I've got a friend who always says, you know, what you read is not necessarily as important as who you read. So who is Peter Williams? Peter Williams is a really outstanding New Testament scholar based at uh, the University of Cambridge. He's principal of an institution called Tyndale House Cambridge, which I think has a claim to be the leading biblical studies library in the world. I had the opportunity to spend quite a bit of time at Tyndale House myself when I was doing my PhD research. And so I know Peter and his work. And he's a, he's a really outstanding scholar. And so when I hear that, I hear super intellectual, really heady. Am I going to be able to relate to a book like Can We Trust the Gospels? Well, Peter's a fine scholar and an intellectual to be sure, but he's written this book to serve the church, to serve the people of God, and he's worked hard to make it really accessible. And that's one of the great hallmarks of this book, and it's one of the reasons why we want to get it into the hands of our listeners. Peter's tackling really fundamental issues, the trustworthiness of the Gospels, the reliability of the Gospels, and he's seeking to make the arguments in favor of the trustworthiness of the Gospels clear and simple and accessible. And, and I think his arguments are compelling, and I'd love to get this book into the hands of our listeners. 
Well, it's called Can We Trust the Gospels? And it is our thank you gift to you as you financially support Encounter the Truth this month. You can give online at EncounterTheTruth.org or call us at 1-833-998-7884. It might be easier to remember as 833-99-TRUTH. Or again, the website is EncounterTheTruth.org. For Jonathan Griffiths, I'm Steve Hiller. Thanks for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time.